Thank you for listening to Namat's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. Sir, I'm Sergeant Wayne Jenkins with the Gun Trace Task Force. So the reason you gentlemen will be stopped today is you don't have a seat on. How come you don't have a seat on, sir? Assignment for the record. Detective Sergeant Wayne Jenkins. Sergeant, how long have you been the police department? Wayne Jenkins loved being a police officer, going after the bad guys. What's in the bag? He was very smart, he knew the law. He was seen as like a super cop. That guy gets the job done. He was on TV at a frequent basis. Unbelievable bust in Baltimore City. Jenkins commandeers a city van, takes it into the middle of the riot grabs these cops, and he rescues them. Wayne Jenkins is awarded a bronze star for his actions. What people didn't know, the supposed hero went out later and robbed the people looting the drugstores. I got promoted to sergeant, I believe, in 2010, and then I was placed in Gun Trace Task Force for Baltimore City. In Baltimore, the officers would stop you. They may take your money, but they wouldn't arrest you. That's a half a key here. Wayne Jenkins up the ante. He was going to rob you, break in your house, and he was going to arrest you. Why can't I look and see what's going on in my car? It's shocking how brazen he was. He put the unit in sort of hyperspeed. He's a psychopath. He's a gangster. That badge and that gun, man, cut him loose. I didn't see anybody. I only saw you guys walking up my walkway. We quickly realized that they were just robbing people left and right on the streets. I'll make a mistake. Don't touch it. He had turned into something that was not even close to being a police officer. We weren't sitting there minding our business. And then... Who are they going to believe? A so-called officer or a person that had a criminal history? I'm a dead man walking. The criminal justice system is built to believe the words of officers. Because if you don't, then that erodes our belief in what's right and what's wrong. They lied. That's what they do, man. These guys had the power to say whatever they wanted to say, and people are going to believe it. Baltimore City Police Department, they didn't care. They just wiped their hands of everything. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 510. Out now in theaters across the US and on demand and digital is I Got a Monster, an investigative documentary that tells the story of corrupt police officer Wayne Jenkins, who, through his criminal actions with the Baltimore Police Department's Elite Gun Trace Task Force, pushed the already strained relations between the police in the black community of Baltimore beyond breaking point. Riveting documentary filmmaking that engrosses with its story of how bad policing can cause a ripple effect throughout a community. I Got a Martin Star also marks the latest film by director Kevin Abrams. I'm glad to say joins me now on a podcast. Kevin, how are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. And, you know, it's really interesting watching your film. You know, I watched it, it was a couple of weeks ago. And there's a film that really kind of like challenged a lot of narratives that I had in my mind about police policing. I got look my, the first the film that really made me want to be do what I do now is Serpico. So I'm not uh, ignorant to the fact that there, oh. there are corrupt police and corrupt policing, but I think the the use of these kind of police task force, um, especially in in the states, I'm pretty sure in Australia we have them too. But I don't know if, if it's any corruption that kind of flowed from it, like there is in in, in the US. What's really interesting about your film is that there's a book of it on it as well called by Baynard Woods with the same title. Usually how it works, right, is the book comes out, the film kind of follows on with it. But in this case, it's kind of like parallel projects happening at the same time. You and Baynard were kind of like working at the same time, researching at the same time, and sharing the same resources. How did it come to be that this collaborative kind of process kind of happened where you're both kind of working on the same story, sharing the same info, and um, kind of diving into the same kind of uh, minefield that is the um, Baltimore Police Department. 
Yeah, Baynard and his uh, co-writer, Brandon Soderbergh, worked locally as reporters for something called The City Paper. And they covered over multiple years when they approached me already, histories of this abuse, the specific abuses by some of these officers, but also globally police abuse going on in Baltimore. So Baynard and I had a pre-existing relationship. He reached out as they were putting together the book proposal, and he thought that there would rightfully be a, a more there there as far as content went. And we decided to embark on the project together. We had really wonderful agents who were able to help Baynard and Brandon set up their book. And so we had this parallel course by accident, but also by reward of going on to the investigation together. They got their book deal. We began production and a lot of the interviews and a lot of the information that we discovered, therefore, could be translated across both mediums. And I think both projects really benefited from it. Um, we gave them access and resource and they gave us access and resource. And the whole notion was to tell the story regardless of anything. So there was never any possessive elements to it. If anything, it was more like we discovered this. Oh, my God, that's crazy. Let's interview this. And they were wonderful. They embraced us. They were locals. We were in some ways California interlopers. <laughs> and they provided a wonderful landing um area for us to jump into. And, and because of that, we were able to get trust from a lot of places that we probably didn't if we went into the conversation by ourselves. Baltimore as a city is really fascinating to me. I mean, as a as a consumer of TV and movies, as a city that shows up quite a bit, right? And especially in, in shows like Homicide and The Wire and so many other places. And the reason is, is, is really obvious is that there is a crime element there and there are stories to be told. Um, can you tell me about Baltimore and another different context though as a the California interloper is going into the city what did you expect from it and what did you learn from it as, as a place because like I said before we know of its reputation but I don't know people actually know the place you know as as, as more intimately as you do now I mean I I expected the wire a hundred percent like I watched the show religiously I thought it was an amazing piece of storytelling when I landed Baynard and Brandon in particular were very good about making me know that that was not Baltimore. That was an element of Baltimore, but it was not Baltimore. I fell in love with the city. It's got a nickname called Charm City, and I think it owns that in an unbelievable way. The people are incredible. I think the aesthetic of the city is underrated and beautiful. The Bay elements, there's just a huge, huge history to it, especially in the United States. And when you get to live in it for the long duration of time that we did you know we'd go for multiple weeks at a time over four to five years to film it just became a secondary home um and that was one of the things that we, we talked about from the beginning Bannard and Brandon were very specific about us just not shooting the rundown areas of it you know not the ruin porn that it was referred to as and making mm. sure that we showed other elements that were beautiful and when we premiered the film last week in Baltimore, the greatest compliment I got was somebody coming up to me and saying, you really showed us the beautiful parts of the city and not just the the unsavory parts. And thank you. So there was a lot of discovery there and in particular, the people. They're amazing. I want to talk about the two, the two kind of main, I guess I'm not going to say the word characters, but just in the context of, of film, I'm going to say that anyway. Uh, Wayne Jenkins being the first one, the super cop the MMA fighter. When you look at it on paper, it almost feels like a movie character. And ironically enough, John Bernthal kind of played a version of him in, in the TV series, uh, We Own the City. When it comes to kind of delving into him um, as a, as a he's, he's, he's kind of as a police officer, what do you learn about him as a person that you think kind of led to his exploitation, not only of the law and of his position, but the exploitation of the people around him? especially people within the black community um, who, you know, he exploited their past criminal records to try to gain access to them and blackmail them and steal from them and do and intimidate them. What is it about him as a person that turned him into this monster uh, that I guess he, I guess he could be referred to in, in the context of the film, uh, the film's title? Yeah, you know, that's that's a great question. It's something that we we thought about for a while. And I can I can only speculate. We weren't able, unfortunately, to sit down and talk with him so I can get some more direct answers. But for me, he's 
just one of those characters that seems to have an appetite for living. Mm. And I think what's dangerous within the context of the Baltimore Police Department and with this type of policing is that when you take somebody like that, you put them into a situation which has the benefit for reward or abuse, they're going to chase most likely both those situations. And with him in particular, he was an unbelievably savvy game player of what he recognized within the system. He chose to go after a darker element of it, and he saw the ways that he can maneuver through it. So for me, it just was a great representation of if you have somebody who's capable of playing games and capable of playing games well, and they get put into the system where the, the outcomes for them are going to be much more selfish and much more damaging, what does that mean for what the system is representing, right? So for us, I, I never was able to sort of get confirmation of the psychology from the personal level, but from the broader level, it showed when you have this systematic type of freedom for policing, the dangers for having somebody who could embrace that darker element, what the outcomes can be. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by T Public. T Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, T Public is sure to have something you will love. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Amazon. The world's leading online store, Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. You know, I think in a lot of ways, I'm a Catholic, um, and I think when I look at kind of like um, people like a Wayne Jenkins who use their position of authority to really exploit their position of power, it kind of reminds me in a lot of ways how a lot of um, uh, priests do the same thing uh, in the whole sexual abuse crisis within the church. Um, And I always seem to wonder, and I've kind of leaned more one way to another, is it the institution that changes the person? Or is it the person is always like that, but they're exploiting the institution and gaining access to things that they that they want? In the case of a Wayne Jenkins and some people similar and police officers similar to him, do you think that it's a case of they are who they are and they know how to gain access to um what I'm trying to say? They they are exploiting the institution to get to 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 kind of do the bad things that they always wanted to do, but they couldn't do beforehand because they didn't have the badge and they didn't have the um, the institution to cover for them? Yeah, I mean, that's an incredibly uh, relevant question, especially in this story, and it's something that we examined for a while. I think he, by nature, had elements that were going to lean this way. Right. I think being put into a situation that has this type of systemic problem, he was embraced by people that were already behaving badly he was taught in a lot of ways the the ways to behave badly within the system now he took advantage of it in an incredibly extreme way but that pre-existed it continues to exist and it's something that all these police departments across the united states are publicly becoming accountable for the problems within this type of behavioral things it is cultural But there's also elements within the culture, too, of people that are really against it and are trying to be good cops and are working hard to restore the public trust within the institution of policing. So it gets complicated in that way, because in a lot of ways, it becomes a mirror to to people like we all have these both sides of our persona. He chose once again to fuel the darker side and the bad behavior as opposed to embracing the good side. Listen, people talk about him being a good cop at times. He had good numbers. His capacity and his hunger for performing existed. Now, if he channeled that all into good, it'd be a much different conversation. Mm. Systemically, people have the opportunity to also steal, rob, 
people will turn the you know blind eye it's part of the conversation that people are are teaching within that his mentors taught him how to do that a lot of people around him have the same type of situations so it's there but once again i think because of his personality it just got amplified in ways that nobody could really think um ivan bates is the other kind of uh, prominent voice in, in the movie um so he's testimony to the commission to restore justice and policing it's kind of like the main kind of like thing we always come back to because he's presenting evidence throughout the film and then you explore that evidence throughout it um he's currently the the state attorney of baltimore at the time of filming he wasn't in a position who was the defense attorney but now he is the state attorney um and it's really interesting about him is that like so far he is very tough on crime like he's got policies right now especially in regards to um i think gun laws so anyone over 21 in baltimore yeah, it's like minimum mm-hmm. sentencing like and i think he's hoping that they were going to like have people in uh make make sure people don't carry guns around in the community because there's a severe kind of punishment towards it um there was a quote i found from him when he was um first in the position of state attorney where he said he he wants to back police to use the laws and tools in your toolbox to do the job um and i found it to be a really kind of curious quote because in a certain way isn't that what jenkins kind of did I mean, he exploited the laws, but he's a very smart, he was a very smart and savvy officer in that he knew what laws to use to get to what he wanted. And those laws were in the toolbox. So isn't another case that in regards to what uh, uh, that Ivan Bates said, uh, use the laws and tools in your toolbox, but use the laws and tools in your toolbox, toolbox in accordance with the law to make sure you do the job in the right way, because anyone can use the laws and tools in your toolbox and, and twist it and bend it and to suit their own thing, but but it doesn't necessarily account to uh, justice, does it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an incredibly accurate assessment, and I'm I'm glad you were able to see that element of it, because that was one of the ways that Jenkins became successful. He knew that if he made arrests, if he put up numbers, if he got people to see that he was effective in certain ways, that would allow him more power and more freedom, because he was showing the police department and the public that he was doing good policing. Now, within that, that obviously hid a bunch of the bad policing that he was doing. And that's one of the the great conversations right now going on in Baltimore and with police, I think, organizations in the United States is where does empowerment and accountability end and start, right? How do you allow them the freedom to do the tough policing, but at the same time, make them accountable within that context? We had a it's got Anthony Barksdale in the film, former deputy commissioner, talking about how he understands the need for undercover policing. Like if you're going to go after these deep seated criminals, you need the ability to do those types of things. But with it needs the actual greater need for accountability. He's not even just talking about normal accountability. He's saying, like, if you give them those freedoms, you have to be twice as hard on them from an accountability standpoint to make sure that they enforcing the law correctly. Because in that gray area, you see all the corruption and you see all the mistakes being made. My final question. Um, you know, there are documentaries in movies that have been made in regards to corrupt police officers, et cetera. But the subject always always been the police officer themselves. Um, and their and their crimes. Well, I think what's really important with I Got a Monster is that um, you look at the ripple effect. You talk to the victims of, of Jenkinson's crimes. Um, you give them the voice. You give them, and you made sure that their face is front and center on your screen. How important was it to make sure that we are shown not only what Jenkins did, but the effect that they did to people? Because there's psychological scarring that comes with something like this, and that psychological scarring can be um uh, passed on from generation to generation from person to person within a community and how important was it to make sure that that was presented in your movie um it was our guiding principle and i'm glad that you were able to recognize that and and that approach because like you i grew up loving serpico and it was a hugely influential movie in, in in my creative journey but that focused on the cops when we got into this conversation to me, what became very apparent was thematically the film became about about not listening to the victims. And once I recognized that, I knew immediately that that had to be our guiding principle. And we have a lot of other stories and a lot of other people that we interview that we weren't weren't able to include in the film. And we are going to get those stories out. We're going to recut three to five minute sections so that we can share more of their stories because 
if you don't listen to the people being abused, there'll never be the ability to change. And for us, that was always what led us in edit. I had it on a card. When in doubt, go back to the victims. So uh, I'm glad that you're able to recognize that. And and once again, that 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 was our our beacon. Well, I think it's just a fantastic job they did here, Kevin. And for everyone listening, I got a monster available now across the US theaters demand on digital, wherever you can find it, watch it. I think it's a really important issue. I think it's a really relevant issue um, that is still being talked about uh, today and has been talked about uh, for the last several years. And, um, you know, like I said before, this is a move that really kind of challenged narratives to me um, in regards to how we see the world, whether it be good, bad, black and white. There's always that murky lines in the middle where people can exploit these uh, kind of like different balances in, within the world. And I think it's really important that we show how they do that and Hopefully, you will set the, the tone to make sure people don't do that, at least as much in the future, because while we can't stop, it's always good to just try to, to stop the tide a little bit. And Kevin, I thank you so very much for your time today, and it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully, hopefully we can do it again in the future. Sounds great. Thank you, Matt. You have a good day. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.